Hello and welcome to this episode of Human Rights Magazine. My name is Derek McCush. The use of children in combat roles is not new in Myanmar. Both the government and some resistance groups have child soldiers with tragic results. Hundreds of children have been killed and tortured by the Myanmar army in recent years. In this episode of Human Rights Magazine, Yuen Li speaks with several experts about the issue. The recruitment and use of child soldiers has been a persisting problem in Myanmar, where children are often coerced, intimidated, and deceived into joining armies. The atrocities against children are done by both Tatmadaw, which is the Burmese National Army, and ethnic resistance groups. In 2002, Myanmar was listed as a country with the highest number of child soldiers by Human Rights Watch, an international non-governmental organization that focuses on human rights advocacy and research. Underage children accounted for 20% or higher of the serving soldiers that year. According to the testimonies given by ex-soldiers, children undergo severe human rights abuse both in military training camps and in war, such as isolation and deprivation from basic nourishment, and they are forced to conduct or witness cruel acts against civilians, causing deep-rooted psychological damage. From 2011 to 2021, under a civilian government. The situation slightly improved, and there were observable patterns of cooperation between the United Nations and the Myanmar government. In June 2012, the Myanmar government signed the Joint Action Plan with the United Nations, which aims to end and prevent the recruitment and use of children by the Tatmadaw. A more strict and regulated age assessment procedure was established, and responsible military directives were implemented. Eventually, 956 children were released and reintegrated. However, there were concerns regarding the large gaps between the government's promises and its actual efficacy. After the takeover of a military coup in 2021, the situation worsened as armed conflicts escalated, and the effectiveness of these agreements became questionable. Human Rights Watch contended that after the signature of the Joint Action Plan, the Myanmar government failed to address the fundamental issue, which is the system of incentives behind unlawful recruitment and the lack of accountability among the military. The UN access to armed forces for verification purposes was denied as well, and authorities sought to exempt and justify the recruitment of 16-year-olds who have completed 10 years of education. Furthermore, there are great complexity and interlinkages between the causes of the widespread recruitment of child soldiers in Myanmar. I spoke with Dr. Alexandre Pelletier. An assistant professor in the Department of Political Science at Laval University, who specializes in Southeast Asian politics, he also serves as the co-director of the Human Rights Observatory. He highlighted a few fundamental causes behind this ingrained issue. So, maybe one of the reasons is、uh, is that the Tatmadaw, the when I say Tatmadaw is the Is the Myanmar, Myanmar armed forces are extremely decentralized、um, in a sense, right? So,、um, especially after the 1990s,、uh, local commanders have lots of leeway、uh, when it comes to the way they fund their activities and the way they operate and interact with villagers and, and population,、um, and Lack of funding, lack of 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 resources, has meant that local commanders have have used any forms of of, of strategies to generate revenues and and generate recruits、uh, to to join the armed force.、Uh, so that's one reason the arm the armed force are quite decentralized. And when we see decentralized armed forces, most of the time it leads to abuses of civilians. Um, decentralized armed forces are also known to lead to more、uh, sexual crimes uh, um, and also the recruitment of children、uh, or, or abuse of children.、Um, 
So some lower ranking officials, uh, of, officers, sorry, are responsible for that practice of recruiting children. So decentralized or fragmented armed force can be one form of explanation. Um, of course, uh, poverty, displacement is another uh, very important um, explanation. Uh, children have been uh, unrooted by war. Some of them are located in refugee camps, IDP camps, sorry. And the vulnerability of children in IDP camps means that, I mean, there's no parents sometimes, so armed groups can go and just recruit children and offer a, 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 a um, the possibility of, you know, or, uh, of, of, or the hope of rewards or the hope of, of living a better life, uh, than the, uh, refugee camps can offer. So, um, so in refugee or IDP camps, you will see both, um, the Tatmada, but also ethnic armed organizations also recruit there. So, um, that's one reason. Uh, displacement, uh, it, it helps explain, uh, the recruitment of children, but also, uh, poverty and lack of education, lack of other oppor- opportunities, really. Uh, can be also one explanation. Another one, of course, it's the lack of manpower, the lack of soldiers, because once you start recruiting among children, I mean, this is probably not the first choice when, when you're a military, um, probably not the first choice to recruit, uh, children because they're not str- very strong, very not trained. But uh, sometimes you have no other choices. So uh, inadequate manpower can be also one one explanation, especially for the Tatmada, which is not very, very popular among the population. So it's extremely difficult to recruit voluntarily. So there's not many people that will join the, the Tatmada voluntarily. Um, so and also they face active armed opposition. So they need to uh, have uh, increased their ranks. Um, so, for example, in 1990s, I think the Tatmada went from 200,000 soldiers to about 400,000. So you don't create soldiers that very easy. So you need to recruit and sometimes coerce people into uh, into the, the armed forces. So um, the lack of manpower. It's something we don't see as much in, in ethnic armed organizations because, of course, uh, they tend to be far more popular among the population because they're resistance forces because they defend their nation, their ethnic group. So we don't see that as much, um, but uh, that's sometimes uh, that's sometimes also the case. Uh, uh, after years and years of war, sometimes you just uh, you just don't have as mo- as many soldiers, uh, prospect soldiers as, as you used to have. So, uh, and also, I mean, lack of legal enforcement. I mean, Myanmar is not a uh, it's not a state that enforce uh, human rights in any ways, and neither does it have the capacity to do so. Especially as as soon as it it's outside the the, the zone uh, that the Myanmar government control better. One of the general strategies of illegal recruitment is by approaching unemployed and alone adolescents in public places, and then asking for identification documents knowing that most adolescents do not carry them. Another common strategy is to tell the children that there is potential job opportunities and deceive the children into military training camps. It is noteworthy that the issue of recruitment of child soldiers intertwines with some other violations and human rights abuse. Ariane Linier, communications officer for the Office of Special Representative of the Secretary General for Children and Armed Conflict, mentioned the linkages between the recruitment and use of children and other grave violations, especially human trafficking. The Office of the Special Representative for Children and Armed Conflict conducted a study to analyze what were the gaps uh, of the mandate for the 25th anniversary of the mandate. And as per the study, a few elements came out and one was trafficking. So um, Mrs. Gamba, the special representative, um, is now working closely um, with the special rapporteur on trafficking. Uh, We are currently working on a study uh, that's being released at the end of the year 
that's going to be released at the end of the in the at the end of the year about the interlinkages between trafficking and the sixth grade violations. Um, and so we can see a clear link already. Um, and so very often, uh, children in the move in particular are extremely vulnerable and are extremely um, at risk of being trafficked. They can be trafficked to join certain armed groups, uh, to, join, to join certain armed forces. Uh, they can be abducted for other reasons, such as sexual violence as well. Um, so there is a clear link between trafficking and the six-way violations. We don't have yet clear figures about how many children are being trafficked to join armed forces and armed groups, but uh, the link between the, the two is is, uh, is clear. And I think that's very much the case when you have, as mentioned, movements of population, which is the case in Myanmar, where we have a lot of international internal displaced person. Um, so that's also um, a, a big risk. Solving the problem of recruiting child soldiers in Myanmar requires a multifaceted approach that addresses both the root causes and the immediate challenges. One way to tackle that is to break down this uh, structure of incentive, right? But there's very little uh, areas where we uh, can do anything at this stage, right? Um, There's recruitment quotas that have been put into place and also um uh by by the military so that's that's difficult and there's there's pure abduction uh, sometimes they will just go and take the kids uh or th- threaten with arrest if they don't come so that's that, that's pure i mean that's there's that's the that's a very uh, illegal violent way of recruiting so sometimes it's it almost appears as more rational for children to join rather than stand on the on the sideline. So that's a lot more difficult to tackle, right, uh, as, a, as a phenomenon. So that means increasing uh, opportunities and resources and education and, and revenue uh, for children so that they don't see this as, a, as the only options they have, right? But that's also, that at this stage of the, of the conflict, it's, it's pretty difficult to implement. Uh, and what we saw during the last decade is that there were there were improvements um, on this, and and the increase in in revenue and human development index did make a difference for the availability of children as recruits uh, for armed groups, um, and and sometimes also I mean recruitment of children is based on children voluntarily joining armed groups to avenge. Parents that were killed by the military to avenge uh, their village being destroyed. Um, well, that that is difficult also to uh, curb as a phenomenon because, of course, wars create uh, all forms of of desire for revenge, and so that that's a lot more difficult to tackle as as a as a as a phenomenon. So. So techniques of recruitment ranging from coercion and abduction, which is clearly legal, that's violent means, to much more complex uh, sources of recruitment. Uh, well, it, it requires certainly a multiplicity of, 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 uh, of means to tackle that. Uh, and of course, what we saw during the, the last decade of reforms is that once kind of the the environment was conducive to that kind of reform. Meanwhile, the UN organizations have been actively engaged in addressing the harrowing issue of child soldier recruitment in Myanmar through multifaceted initiatives and collaborative efforts. Um, so we had um, regular contact and we were able to um, engage with the Myanmar Armed Forces, um, they had a conditionality within the action plan as well to really push them not to um, not to recruit and use children anymore. Um, of course, since 2012, the context have, has evolved and has changed massively. Um, and so we are now trying to keep the contact and to still engage with the Myanmar Armed Forces. Um, we try to exchange letters and really engage as much as we can. Um, the SRSG was planning on traveling to Myanmar, but unfortunately she has not been able to do so 
uh, as of yet. So um, we are really trying to continue the engagement because the researcher really believes in the in the engagement with parties to conflict. Um, and so we are going to continue because, you know, we believe that this is extremely important and that's part of our responsibility um, as co-signatories of the of the joint action plan. And of course, our colleagues on the ground are still in touch on a regular basis to try to push and to follow up on the implementation of the joint action plan. I mean, for us, we are trying to work um, closely with the regional organization. And so, of course, something about the ASEAN. So we're trying also to work closely with the ASEAN uh, and all, all the ASEAN members um, and collaborate uh, on possibilities to help provide solutions um, in, in supporting children affected by conflict. Um, so for us, it's very important to continue the discussion. Um, our office has a responsibility to provide information and to provide verified information. And for us, it's important that this information is being used and it's being used by member states um, for their own advocacy, for their own political engagement. Uh, and so we are really standing ready to collaborate and provide as much as permission to, to support this advocacy uh, in order to find a solution. Um, and our office um, uh, reports on Myanmar. Um, so we are also having and working closely with the UN Security Council Working Group on Children in Armed Conflict. So we are the only mandate that has a working group um, in the UN Security Council. So that's an opportunity for us as well um, to report on the situation in Myanmar through the country report that we are publishing every two years. Um, and following the, the publication of the country report, there are recommendations um, and usually there are conclusions as well. The conclusions on Myanmar have not yet been adopted. And so we're still engaging with member states for them to really take on board the conclusions and or take on board the recommendations and adopt conclusions. Um, but we do have also a space where we can engage directly with member states on this specific country. In conclusion, the issue of recruitment and utilization of child soldiers in Myanmar remains a deeply concerning and urgent human rights challenge. Addressing this issue demands not only immediate action to rescue and rehabilitate affected children, but also a long-term commitment to address the root causes such as civil war, poverty, and lack of education. The global community must continue to apply diplomatic pressure, advocate for policy changes, and provide support to effectively end the egregious practice of recruiting child soldiers in Myanmar, safeguarding the rights and futures of its youth. Thank you for listening to this episode of Human Rights Magazine. The podcast is brought to you by the Upstream Journal. I invite you to consider supporting the program and the magazine with a contribution through PayPal as you explore other episodes.